The Excursion Note and preface by William Wordsworth Something must now be said of this poem, but chiefly, as has been done through the whole of these notes, with reference to my personal friends, and especially to her who has perseveringly taken them down from my dictation. Towards the close of the first book stand the lines that were first written, beginning, nine tedious years, and ending, last human tenant of these ruined walls. These were composed in 95 at Race Down, and for several passages describing the employment and demeanor of Margaret during her affliction, I was indebted to observations made in Dorsetshire, and afterwards at Alfoxton in Somersetshire, where I resided in 97 and 98. The lines towards the conclusion of the fourth book beginning, for, the man, who, in this spirit, to the words intellectual soul were in order of time composed the next, either at Racedown or Alfoxton, I do not remember which. The rest of the poem was written in the Vale of Grasmere, chiefly during our residence at Allen Bank. The long poem on my own education was, together with many minor poems, composed while we lived at the cottage at Town End. Perhaps my purpose of giving an additional interest to these my poems in the eyes of my nearest and dearest friends may be promoted by saying a few words upon the character of the wanderer, the solitary, and the pastor, and some other of the persons introduced. And first, of the principal one, the wanderer. My lamented friend Saudi, for this is written a month after his decease, used to say that had he been born a papist, the course of life which would in all probability have been his was the one for which he was most fitted and most to his mind, that of a Benedictine monk in a convent, furnished, as many once were and some still are, with an inexhaustible library. Books, as appears from many passages in his writings, and as was evident to those who had opportunities of observing his daily life, were in fact his passion, and wandering, I can with truth affirm, was mine. But this propensity in me was happily counteracted by inability from want of fortune to fulfill my wishes. But, had I been born in a class which would have deprived me of what is called a liberal education, it is not unlikely that, being strong in body, I should have taken to a way of life such as that in which my peddler passed the greater part of his days. At all events, I am here called upon freely to acknowledge that the character I have represented in his person is chiefly an idea of what I fancied my own character might have become in his circumstances. Nevertheless, much of what he says and does had an external existence that fell under my own youthful and subsequent observation. An individual named Patrick, by birth and education a Scotchman, followed this humble occupation for many years, and afterwards settled in the town of Kendall. He married a kinswoman of my wife's, and her sister Sarah was brought up from her ninth year under this good man's roof. My own imaginations I was happy to find clothed in reality, and fresh ones suggested, by what she reported of this man's tenderness of heart, his strong and pure imagination, and his solid attainments in literature, chiefly religious whether in prose or verse. At Hawkshead also, while I was a schoolboy, there occasionally resided a packman, the name then generally given to persons of this calling, with whom I had frequent conversations upon what had befallen him, and what he had observed, during his wandering life, and, as was natural, we took much to each other, and, upon the subject of peddlerism in general, as then followed, and its favorableness to an intimate knowledge of human concerns, not merely among the humbler classes of society, I need say nothing here in addition to what is to be found in the excursion, and a note attached to it. Now for the solitary. Of him I have much less to say. Not long after we took up our abode at Grasmere, came to reside there, from what motive I either never knew or have forgotten, a Scotchman a little past the middle of life, who had for many years been chaplain to a Highland regiment. He was in no respect as far as I know, an interesting character, though in his appearance there was a good deal that attracted attention, as if he had been shattered in fortune and not happy in mind. Of his quantum position I availed myself, to connect with the wanderer, also a Scotchman, a character suitable to my purpose, the elements of which I drew from several persons with whom I had been connected, and who fell under my observation during frequent residences in London at the beginning of the French Revolution. The chief of these was, one may now say, a Mr. Fawcett, a preacher at a dissenting meeting house at the Old Jury. 
It happened to me several times to be one of his congregation through my connection with Mr. Nicholson of Cade Adam Street, who at that time, when I had not many acquaintances in London, used often to invite me to dine with him on Sundays, and I took that opportunity, Mr. N being a dissenter, of going to hear Fawcett, who was an able and eloquent man. He published a poem on war, which had a good deal of merit, and made me think more about him than I should otherwise have done. But his Christianity was probably never very deeply rooted, and, like many others in those times of like showy talents, he had not strength of character to withstand the effects of the French Revolution, and of the wild and lax opinions which had done so much towards producing it, and far more in carrying it forward in its extremes. Poor Fawcett, I have been told, became pretty much such a person as I have described, and early disappeared from the stage, having fallen into habits of intemperance, which I have heard, though I will not answer for the fact, hastened his death. Of him I need say no more, there were many like him at that time, which the world will never be without, but which were more numerous than for reasons too obvious to be dwelt upon. To what is said of the pastor in the poem I have little to add what may be deemed superfluous. It has ever appeared to me highly favorable to the beneficial influence of the Church of England upon all gradations and classes of society, that the patronage of its benefices is in numerous instances attached to the estates of noble families of ancient gentry, and accordingly I am gratified by the opportunity afforded me in the excursion, to portray the character of a country clergyman of more than ordinary talents, born and bred in the upper ranks of society so as to partake of their refinements, and at the same time brought by his pastoral office and his love of rural life into intimate connection with the peasantry of his native district. To illustrate the relation which in my mind this pastor bore to the wanderer, and the resemblance between them, or rather the points of community in their nature, I likened one to an oak and the other to a sycamore, and, having here referred to this comparison, I need only add, I had no one individual in my mind, wishing rather to embody this idea than to break in upon the simplicity of it, by traits of individual character or of any peculiarity of opinion. And now for a few words upon the scene where these interviews and conversations are supposed to occur. The scene of the first book of the poem is, I must own, laid in a tract of country not sufficiently near to that which soon comes into view in the second book, to agree with the fact. All that relates to Margaret and the ruined cottage, etc., was taken from observations made in the southwest of England, and certainly it would require more than seven league boots to stretch in one morning from a common in Somersetshire or Dorsetshire to the heights of Furnace Fells and the deep valleys they embosom. For thus dealing with space I need make, I trust, no apology, but my friends may be amused by the truth. In the poem, I suppose that the peddler and I ascended from a plain country up the Vale of Langdale, and struck off a good way above the chapel to the western side of the Vale. We ascended the hill and thence looked down upon the circular recess in which lies Bleetarn, chosen by the solitary for his retreat. After we quit his cottage, passing over a low ridge we descend into another vale, that of Little Langdale, towards the head of which stands, embowered or partly shaded by yews and other trees, something between a cottage and a mansion or gentleman's house such as they once were in this country. This I convert into the parsonage, and at the same time, and as by the waving of a magic wand, I turn the comparatively confined vale of Langdale, its tarn, and the rude chapel which once adorned the valley, into the stately and comparatively spacious vale of Grasmere, its lake, and its ancient parish church, and upon the side of Loch Rigg Fell, at the foot of the lake, and looking down upon it and the whole vale and its encompassing mountains, the pastor is supposed by me to stand, when it sunset he addresses his companions in words which I hope my readers will remember, for I should not have taken the trouble of giving so much in detail the materials on which my mind actually worked. Now for a few particulars of fact respecting the persons whose stories are told or characters are described by the different speakers. To Margaret I have already alluded. I will add here, that the lines beginning, she was a woman of a steady mind, faithfully delineate, as far as they go, the character possessed in common by many women whom it has been my happiness to know in humble life, and that several of the most touching things which she is represented as saying and doing are taken from actual observation of the distresses and trials under which different persons were suffering, some of them strangers to me, 
and others daily under my notice. I was born too late to have a distinct remembrance of the origin of the American War, but the state in which I represent Robert's mind to be I had frequent opportunities of observing at the commencement of our rupture with France in 93, opportunities of which I availed myself in the story of the female vagrant as told in the poem on guilt and sorrow. The account given by the solitary towards the close of the second book, in all that belongs to the character of the old man, was taken from a Grasmere pauper, who was boarded in the last house quitting the Vale on the road to Ambleside, the character of his hostess, and all that befell the poor man upon the mountain, belonged to Paterdale, the woman I knew well, her name was Jay, and she was exactly such a person as I describe. The ruins of the old chapel, among which the man was found lying, may yet be traced, and stood upon the ridge that divides Paterdale from Bordale and Martindale, having been placed there for the convenience of both districts. The glorious appearance disclosed above and among the mountains was described partly from what my friend Mr. Luff, who then lived in Paterdale, witnessed upon that melancholy occasion, and partly from what Mrs. Wordsworth and I had seen in company with Sir George and Lady Beaumont above Hart Show Hall on our way from Paterdale to Ambleside. And now for a few words upon the church, its monuments, and the deceased who are spoken of as lying in the surrounding churchyard. But first for the one picture, given by the pastor and the wanderer, of the living. In this nothing is introduced but what was taken from nature and real life. The cottage is called Hackett, and stands as described on the southern extremity of the ridge which separates the two Langdales, the pair who inhabited it were called Jonathan and Betty Udall. Once when our children were ill, a whooping cough I think, we took them for change of air to this cottage, and were in the habit of going there to drink tea upon fine summer afternoons, so that we became intimately acquainted with the characters, habits, and lives of these good, and, let me say, in the main, wise people. The matron had, in her early youth, been a servant in a house at Hawkshead, where several boys boarded, while I was a schoolboy there. I did not remember her as having served in that capacity, but we had many little anecdotes to tell to each other of remarkable boys, incidents, and adventures which had made a noise in their day in that small town. These two persons afterwards settled at Rydal, where they both died. The church, as already noticed, instead of Grasmere. The interior of it has been improved lately made warmer by underdrawing the roof and raising the floor but the root and antique majesty of its former appearance has been impaired by painting the rafters, and the oak benches, with the simple rail at the back dividing them from each other, have given way to seats that have more the appearance of pews. It is remarkable that, excepting only the few belonging to Rydal Hall, that to Rydal Mount, the one to the parsonage, and I believe another, the men and women still continue, as used to be the custom in Wales, to sit separate from each other. Is this practice as old as the Reformation? And when and how did it originate? In the Jewish synagogues and in Lady Huntington's chapels the sexes are divided in the same way. In the adjoining churchyard greater changes have taken place. It is now not a little crowded with tombstones, and near the schoolhouse which stands in the churchyard is an ugly structure built to receive the hearse, which has recently come into use. It would not be worthwhile to allude to this building or the hearse vehicle it contains, but that the latter has been the means of introducing a change much to be lamented in the mode of conducting funerals among the mountains. Now, the coffin is lodged in the hearse at the door of the house of the deceased, and the corpse is so conveyed to the churchyard gate, all the solemnity which formerly attended its progress, as described in the poem, is put an end to. So much do I regret this, that I beg to be excused for giving utterance here to a wish that, should it befall me to die at Rydal Mount, my own body may be carried to Grasmere Church after the manner in which, till lately, that of every one was born to that place of sepulture, namely, on the shoulders of neighbors, no house being passed without some words of a funeral song being sung at the time by the attendants. When I put into the mouth of the wanderer, many precious rites and customs of our rural ancestry are gone or stealing from us, this I hope will last forever, and what follows, little did I foresee that the observance and mode of proceeding, which had often affected me so much, would so soon be superseded. Having said much of the injury done to this churchyard, let me add that one is at liberty to look forward to a time when, by the growth of the yew trees, thriving there, 
that solemnity will be spread over the place that will in some degree make amends for the old simple character which has already been so much encroached upon, and will be still more every year. I will here set down, more at length, what has been mentioned in a previous note, that my friend Sir George Beaumont, having long ago purchased the beautiful piece of water called Loch Rig Tarn, on the banks of which he intended to build, I told him that a person in Kendall who was attached to the place wished to purchase it. Sir George, finding the possession of no use to him, consented to part with it, and placed the purchase money twenty pounds at my disposal for any local use which I thought proper. Accordingly I resolved to plant yew trees in the churchyard, and had four pretty strong large oak enclosures made, in each of which was planted, under my own eye, and principally if not entirely by my own hand, two young trees, with the intention of leaving the one that throve best to stand. Many years after, Mr. Barber, who will long be remembered in Grasmere, Mr. Greenwood, the chief landed proprietor, and myself, had four other enclosures made in the churchyard at our own expense, in each of which was planted a tree taken from its neighbor, and they all stand thriving admirably, the fences having been removed as no longer necessary. May the trees be taken care of hereafter when we are all gone, and some of them will perhaps at some far distant time rival in majesty the U of Lorden and those which I have described as growing in Borrowdale, where they are still to be seen in grand assemblage. And now for the persons that are selected as lying in the churchyard. But first for the individual whose grave is prepared to receive him. His story is here truly related, he was a schoolfellow of mine for some years. He came to us when he was at least 17 years of age, very tall, robust, and full grown. This prevented him from falling into the amusements and games of the school, consequently he gave more time to books. He was not remarkably bright or quick, but by industry he made a progress more than respectable. His parents not being wealthy enough to send him to college, when he left Hawkshead he became a schoolmaster, with a view to prepare himself for holy orders. About this time he fell in love as related in the poem, and everything followed as there described, except that I do not know when and where he died. The number of youths that came to Hawkshead School, from the families of the humble yeomanry, to be educated to a certain degree of scholarship as a preparation for the church, was considerable, and the fortunes of these persons in afterlife various of course, and of some not a little remarkable. I have now one of this class in my eye who became an usher in a preparatory school and ended in making a large fortune. His manners when he came to Hawkshead were as uncouth as well could be, but he had good abilities, with skill to turn them to account, and when the master of the school, to which he was usher, died, he stepped into his place and became proprietor of the establishment. He contrived to manage it with such address, and so much to the taste of what is called high society in the fashionable world, that no school of the kind, even till he retired, was in such high request. Ministers of state, the wealthiest gentry, and nobility of the first rank, vied with each other in bespeaking a place for their sons in the seminary of this fortunate teacher. In the solitude of Grasmere, while living as a married man in a cottage of eight pounds per annum rent, I often used to smile at the tales which reached me of his brilliant career. Not two hundred yards from the cottage in Grasmere, just mentioned, to which I retired, this gentleman, who many years afterwards purchased a small estate in the neighborhood, is now erecting a boathouse, with an upper story to be resorted to as an entertaining room when he and his associates may feel inclined to take their pastime on the lake. Every passenger will be disgusted with the sight of this edifice, not merely as a tasteless thing in itself, but as utterly out of place, and peculiarly fitted, as far as it is observed, and it obtrudes itself on notice at every point of view, to mar the beauty and destroy the pastoral simplicity of the veil. For my own part and that of my household it is our utter detestation, Standing by a shore to which, before the high road was made to pass that way, we used daily and hourly to repair for seclusion and for the shelter of a grove under which I composed many of my poems, the brothers especially, and for this reason we gave the grove that name. That which each man loved and prized in his peculiar nook of earth dies with him, or is changed. So much for my old school fellow and his exploits. I will only add that the foundation has twice failed, from the late no doubt being intolerant of the intrusion. The minor, 
next described as having found his treasure after twice ten years of labor, lived in Paterdale, and the story is true to the letter. It seems to me, however, rather remarkable that the strength of mind which had supported him through this long unrewarded labor did not enable him to bear its successful issue. Several times in the course of my life I have heard of sudden influxes of great wealth being followed by derangement, and in one instance the shock of good fortune was so great as to produce absolute idiocy, but these all happened where there had been little or no previous effort to acquire the riches, and therefore such a consequence might the more naturally be expected than in the case of the solitary miner. In reviewing his story, one cannot but regret that such perseverance was not sustained by a worthier object. Archimedes leapt out of his bath and ran about the streets proclaiming his discovery in a transport of joy, but we are not told that he lost either his life or his senses in consequence. The next character, to whom the priest is led by contrast with the resoluteness displayed by the foregoing, is taken from a person born and bred in Grasmere, by name Dawson, and whose talents, disposition, and way of life were such as are here delineated. I did not know him but all was fresh in memory when we settled at Grasmere in the beginning of the century. From this point, the conversation leads to the mention of two individuals who, by their several fortunes, were, at different times, driven to take refuge at the small and obscure town of Hawkshead on the skirt of these mountains. Their stories I had from the dear old dame with whom, as a schoolboy and afterwards, I lodged for nearly the space of ten years. The elder, the Jacobite, was named Drummond, and was of a high family in Scotland, the Hanoverian Whig bore the name of Van Deppet, and might perhaps be a descendant of some Dutchman who had come over in the train of King William. At all events his zeal was such that he ruined himself by a contest for the representation of London or Westminster, undertaken to support his party, and retired to this corner of the world, selected, as it had been by Drummond, for that obscurity which, since visiting the lakes became fashionable, it has no longer retained. So much was this region considered out of the way till a late period, that persons who had fled from justice used often to resort hither for concealment, and some were so bold as to, not unfrequently, make excursions from the place of their retreat, for the purpose of committing fresh offenses. Such was particularly the case with two brothers of the name of Weston who took up their abode at Old Bratte, I think about seventy years ago. They were highwaymen, and lived there some time without being discovered, though it was known that they often disappeared in a way and upon errands which could not be accounted for. Their horses were noticed as being of a choice breed, and I have heard from the Ralph family, one of whom was a saddler in the town of Kendall, that they were curious in their saddles and housings and accoutrements of their horses. They, as I have heard, and as was universally believed, were in the end both taken and hanged. Tall was her stature, her complexion dark and saturnine. This person lived at Town End, and was almost our next neighbor. I have little to notice concerning her beyond what is said in the poem. She was a most striking instance how far a woman may surpass in talent, in knowledge, and culture of mind, those within among whom she lives, and yet fall below them in Christian virtues of the heart and spirit. It seemed almost, and I say it with grief, that in proportion as she excelled in the one, she failed in the other. How frequently has one to observe in both sexes the same thing, and how mortifying is the reflection. As, on a sunny bank, a tender lamb lurks in safe shelter from the winds of March. The story that follows was told to Mrs. Wordsworth and my sister by the sister of this unhappy young woman, and every particular was exactly as I have related. The party was not known to me, though she lived at Hogshead, but it was after I left school. The clergyman, who administered comfort to her in her distress, I knew well. Her sister who told the story was the wife of a leading yeoman in the Vale of Grasmere, and they were an affectionate pair and greatly respected by everyone who knew them. Neither lived to be old, and their estate which was perhaps the most considerable then in the Vale, and was endeared to them by many remembrances of a salutary character not easily understood, or sympathized with by those who are born to great affluence passed to their eldest son, according to the practice of these veils, who died soon after he came into possession. He was an amiable and promising youth, but was succeeded by an only brother, a good-natured man, who fell into habits of drinking, 
by which he gradually reduced his property, and the other day the last acre of it was sold, and his wife and children and he himself, still surviving, have very little left to live upon, which it would not perhaps have been worthwhile to record here but that, through all trials, this woman has proved a model of patience, meekness, affectionate forbearance, and forgiveness. Their eldest son, who, through the vices of his father, has thus been robbed of an ancient family inheritance, was never heard to murmur or complain against the cause of their distress, and is now, 1843, deservedly the chief prop of his mother's hopes. The clergyman and his family described at the beginning of the seventh book were, during many years, our principal associates in the Vale of Grasmere, unless I were to accept our very nearest neighbors. I have entered so particularly into the main points of their history, that I will barely testify in prose that with the single exception of the particulars of their journey to Grasmere, which, however, was exactly copied from in another instance the whole that I have said of them is as faithful to the truth as words can make it. There was much talent in the family, the eldest son was distinguished for poetical talent, of which a specimen is given in my notes to the sonnets to the Dudden. Once, when in our cottage at town and I was talking with him about poetry, in the course of conversation I presumed to find fault with the versification of Pope, of whom he was an enthusiastic admirer, he defended him with a warmth that indicated much irritation, nevertheless I would not abandon my point, and said, in compass and variety of sound your own versification surpasses his. Never shall I forget the change in his countenance and tone of voice, the storm was laid in a moment, he no longer disputed my judgment, and I passed immediately in his mind, no doubt, for as great a critic as ever lived. I ought to add, he was a clergyman and a well-educated man, and his verbal memory was the most remarkable of any individual I have known, except a Mr. Archer, an Irishman, who lived several years in this neighborhood, and who, in this faculty, was a prodigy, he afterwards became deranged, and I fear continues so, if alive. Then follows the character of Robert Walker, for which see notes to the Dudden. Then that of the deaf man, whose epitaph may be seen in the churchyard at the head of Hosswater, and whose qualities of mind and heart, and their benign influence in conjunction with his privation, I had from his relatives on the spot. The blind man, next commemorated, was John Goff, of Kendall, a man known, far beyond his neighborhood, for his talents and attainments in natural history and science. Of the infant's grave, next noticed, I will only say, it is an exact picture of what fell under my own observation, and all persons who are intimately acquainted with cottage life must often have observed like instances of the working of the domestic affections. A volley thrice repeated over the course let down into the hollow of that grave. This young volunteer bore the name of Dawson, and was younger brother, if I am not mistaken, to the prodigal of whose character and fortunes an account is given towards the beginning of the preceding book. The father of the family I knew well, he was a man of literary education and of experience in society much beyond what was common among the inhabitants of the Vale. He had lived a good while in the highlands of Scotland, as a manager of ironworks at Bunop, and had acted as clerk to one of my predecessors in the office of distributor of stamps, when he used to travel round the country collecting and bringing home the money due to government, in gold, which, it may be worthwhile to mention for the sake of my friends, was deposited in the cell or iron closet under the west window of the long room at Rydal Mount, which still exists with the iron doors that guarded the property. This of course was before the time of bills and notes. The two sons of this person had no doubt been led by the knowledge of their father to take more delight in scholarship, and had been accustomed in their own minds to take a wider view of social interests than was usual among their associates. The premature death of this gallant young man was much lamented, and, as an attendant at the funeral, I myself witnessed the ceremony and the effect of it as described in the poem. Tradition tells that, in Eliza's golden days, a knight came on a war horse. The house is gone. The pillars of the gateway in front of the mansion remained when we first took up our abode at Grasmere. 
two or three cottages still remain, which are called not houses from the name of the gentleman, I have called him a knight, concerning whom these traditions survive. He was the ancestor of the Onot family, formerly considerable proprietors in the district. What follows in the discourse of the wanderer upon the changes he had witnessed in rural life, by the introduction of machinery, is truly described from what I myself saw during my boyhood and early youth, and from what was often told me by persons of this humble calling. Happily, most happily, for these mountains, the mischief was diverted from the banks of their beautiful streams, and transferred to open and flat countries abounding in coal, where the agency of steam was found much more effectual for carrying on those demoralizing works. Had it not been for this invention, long before the present time every torrent and river in this district would have had its factory, large and populous in proportion to the power of the water that could there have been commanded. Parliament has interfered to prevent the night work which was once carried on in these mills as actively as during the daytime, and by necessity still more perniciously a sad disgrace to the proprietors, and to the nation which could so long tolerate such unnatural proceedings. Reviewing at this late period, 1843, what I put into the mouths of my interlocutors a few years after the commencement of the century, I grieve that so little progress has been made in diminishing the evils deplored, or promoting the benefits of education which the wanderer anticipates. The results of Lord Ashley's labors to defer the time when children might legally be allowed to work in factories, and his endeavors to limit still farther the hours of permitted labor, have fallen far short of his own humane wishes, and those of every benevolent and right-minded man who has carefully attended to this subject, and in the present session of Parliament, 1843, Sir James Graham's attempt to establish a course of religious education among the children employed in factories has been abandoned, in consequence of what might easily have been foreseen, the vehement and turbulent opposition of the dissenters, so that, for many years to come, it may be thought expedient to leave the religious instruction of children entirely in the hands of the several denominations of Christians in the island, each body to work according to its own means and in its own way. Such is my own confidence, a confidence I share with many others of my most valued friends, in the superior advantages, both religious and social, which attend the course of instruction presided over and guided by the clergy of the Church of England, that I have no doubt that, if but once its members, lay and clerical, were duly sensible of those benefits, their church would daily gain ground, and rapidly, upon every shape and fashion of dissent, and in that case, a great majority in Parliament. Being sensible of these benefits, the ministers of the country might be emboldened, were it necessary, to apply funds of the state to the support of education on church principles. Before I conclude, I cannot forbear noticing the strenuous efforts made at this time in Parliament, by so many persons, to extend manufacturing and commercial industry at the expense of agricultural, though we have recently had abundant proofs that the apprehensions expressed by the wanderer were not groundless. I spake of mischief by the wise diffused with gladness, thinking that the more it spreads the healthier, the securer, we become delusion which a moment may destroy. The Chartists are well aware of this possibility, and cling to it with an ardor and perseverance which nothing but wiser and more brotherly dealing towards the many, on the part of the wealthy few, can moderate or remove. While, from the grassy mountain's open side, we gazed, in silence hushed. The point here fixed upon in my imagination is halfway up the northern side of Loch Rig Fell, from which the pastor and his companions were supposed to look upwards to the sky and mountain tops, and round the vale, with the lake lying immediately beneath them. But turned not without welcome promise made, that he would share the pleasures and pursuits of yet another summer's day, consumed and wandering with us. When I reported this promise of the solitary, and long after, it was my wish, and I might say intention, that we should resume our wanderings, and pass the borders into his native country, where, as I hoped, he might witness, in the society of the wanderer, some religious ceremony a sacrament, say, in the open fields, or a preaching among the mountains which, by recalling to his mind the days of his early childhood, when he had been present on such occasions in company with his parents and nearest kindred, might have dissolved his heart into tenderness, and so have done more towards restoring the Christian faith in which he had been educated, 
and, with that, contentedness and even cheerfulness of mind, than all that the wanderer and pastor, by their several effusions and addresses, had been able to effect. An issue like this was in my intentions. But, alas, with the wreck of his and was, things incomplete and purposes betrayed make sadder transits over thoughts optic glass than noblest objects utterly decay. Underscore 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 to the right on William, Earl of Lonsdale, Paging etc. etc. Locked, through thy fair domains, illustrious peer. In youth I roamed, on youthful pleasures bent, and mused in rocky cell or sylvan tent, beside swift flowing lothers current clear. Now, by thy care befriended, I appear before thee, Lonsdale, and this work present, a token, may it prove a monument, of high respect and gratitude sincere. Gladly would I have waited till my task had reached its close, but life is insecure, and hopeful off fallacious as a dream, therefore, for what is here produced, I ask thy favor, trusting that thou wilt not deem me offering, though imperfect, premature. William Wordsworth Rival Mount, Westmoreland July 29, 1814 Preface to the edition of 1814 The title page announces that this is only a portion of a poem, and the reader must be here apprised that it belongs to the second part of a long and laborious work, which is to consist of three parts. The author will candidly acknowledge that, if the first of these had been completed, and in such a manner as to satisfy his own mind, he should have preferred the natural order of publication, and have given that to the world first, but, as the second division of the work was designed to refer more to passing events, and to an existing state of things, than the others were meant to do, more continuous exertion was naturally bestowed upon it, and greater progress made here than in the rest of the poem, and as this part does not depend upon the preceding to a degree which will materially injure its own peculiar interest, the author, complying with the earnest entreaties of some valued friends, presents the following pages to the public. It may be proper to state whence the poem, of which the excursion is a part, derives its title of the recluse. Several years ago, when the author retired to his native mountains, with the hope of being enabled to construct a literary work that might live, it was a reasonable thing that he should take a review of his own mind, and examine how far nature and education had qualified him for such employment. As subsidiary to this preparation, he undertook to record, in verse, the origin and progress of his own powers, as far as he was acquainted with them. That work the prelude, addressed to a dear friend, most distinguished for his knowledge and genius, and to whom the author's intellect is deeply indebted, has been long finished, and the result of the investigation which gave rise to it was a determination to compose a philosophical poem, containing views of man, nature, and society, and to be entitled, The Recluse, as having for its principal subject the sensations and opinions of a poet living in retirement. The preparatory poem on is biographical, and conducts the history of the author's mind to the point when he was emboldened to hope that his faculties were sufficiently matured for entering upon the arduous labor which he had proposed to himself, and the two works have the same kind of relation to each other, if he may so express himself, as the anti-chapel has to the body of a Gothic church. Continuing this illusion, he may be permitted to add, that his minor pieces, which have been long before the public, when they shall be properly arranged, will be found by the attentive reader to have such connection with the main work as may give them claim to be likened to the little cells, oratories, and sepulchral recesses, ordinarily included in those edifices. The author would not have deemed himself justified in saying, upon this occasion, so much of performance is either unfinished or unpublished, if he had not thought that the labor bestowed by him upon what he has heretofore and now laid before the public entitled him to candid attention for such a statement as he thinks necessary to throw light upon his endeavors to please and, he would hope, to benefit his countrymen. Nothing further need be added, than that the first and third parts of the recluse will consist chiefly of meditations in the author's own person, and that in the intermediate part, the excursion, the intervention of characters speaking is employed, and something of a dramatic form adopted. 
It is not the author's intention formally to announce a system, it was more animating to him to proceed in a different course, and if he shall succeed in conveying to the mind clear thoughts, lively images, and strong feelings, the reader will have no difficulty in extracting the system for himself. And in the meantime the following passage, taken from the conclusion of the first book of The Recluse, may be acceptable as a kind of prospectus of the design and scope of the whole poem.